I got a great question the other day. Basically, it was, what can statistics tell us? And it was framed around social uh, statistics. And when you have good statistics, statistics is just information. When you have good information, you can go to the store and buy another bag of sugar because you know you're going to run out in a day or two. So there's innocent statistics, something that you just do as a natural course of your day. That's uh, predictive. You're predicted that you're going to run out of sugar. So, but you only buy one bag of sugar because you also predict, expect, hope that the tides are normal and the next time you go to the store, they'll have the bag of sugar that you need. So these things are just part of our natural course through the day and I'm merely framing it, making maybe a little bit more conscious that we use these tools. We have them inherently as part of where we come and go. So big statistics just become more precise. I'm assuming these are valid, this is valid information. And some of it is valid to some degree, right? Like sex. The typical societal choice is male or female. Or should I say was male or female. Until society as a whole learned a little more about sexuality. But that base male-female is still there. You can't, it didn't go away. It's not a bad thing. So these statistics, the analysis of these statistics, how we use them, are very nuanced and subtle. When a professional would approach these numbers, you analyze the information that you're going to use. It has to be relevant, good, and pertinent. So, is male-female relevant and pertinent? On a very gross level, it's a valid question. Personally, it can be offensive. But we need to be able to talk about these and the nuance in between. So, the challenge with doing human type of predictions is that free will notion. You can take a four-way stop and you can say three out of four cars are going to turn right if you have enough information to make that statement. And if you're wrong, you had bad information. But you can only say that gross. The one car that comes to the intersection by itself, you don't know which way it's going to turn. The next car that comes to the intersection, you don't know it. But you know when a hundred cars go by, about 75 of them are going to make a right turn. One of them's probably going to drive into the ditch or two because they're... <laughs> so, that's the uh, that's the challenges when when presenting statistics is understanding them. So these huge predictive models that we have, like atmospheric models, they go back to decades of written measurements. Some of them so old, they're written in different languages, archaic languages. The basis of the measurements were different and have to be converted. So people put these together. And then people go look at them and say, hey, wait a minute. And then people reassemble it. It doesn't get thrown away necessarily. It gets reevaluated. It, it gets a note. 
in a metadata level, information about the information that, hey, corrections were applied to this data set for this reason, now you know. You have to decide whether that data set is a part of your query. Now, on top of that, you have to put in your mind this data. You see it as CGI on your screens, but the machines building the CGI are in a different realm. You can find their IP addresses and try to go talk to them, but usually you have to have license to see these things. So with this analysis comes massive software licensing packages for applications and people to go use those things and look at them and discern and tune and fine tune. And it's a recurring repetitive process, part of the ecosystem of uh, whichever endeavor we're speaking to. So the statistics portion of this Today, trying to look at this virus, how it travels, where it travels, to understand the history of how all of these work, the transmission through droplets in the air, expelled from your lungs, this we know, this is how it works, but for that one person, we're not sure. But over information gathering, good information gathering from good people with good hearts and good intents, trusted data sets, you get into, in science, there is a chain of custody requirement for many, many of the work that scientists use so they can go back and see where it came from and analyze it. In the case of NASA's space program, the moon rock storage vault that I witnessed and saw stood next to, saw the instrument that analyzes elemental analysis of whatever you can turn into a sample in a level five security room because we didn't know what viruses might or might not be on, not just viruses, prions. There are all types of things that these moon rocks could have held and contained. So they were put in what we know is one of the top isolation levels that humans knew how to do. Decades ago, decades ago. So these statistics, the analysis and the use of these statistics also requires tools. And this is something that we're lacking in. You've all succumbed to the easy monthly payments for all the software that you use to present. I have a cell phone by choice and by... Uh, cell phones are trigger items for me. So I have a hard time socializing, <laughs> or it's an excuse. So big data is worth trying to understand how it's used for and against us. Now, I mention this because this information looks an awful lot like how the tobacco industry misused their wealth to mislead the public on an on honest conversation. How the chemical industry used their wealth of information to guide the path of the EPA's actions on pollution, environmental pollution. This is people paid well to sit around and discuss and think and do these things for better or for worse, for good or for evil, for profit or wars. So we need to stop making their armies. <laughs>